Father, we come before you again and we open our spirit to you. And Lord, as this book is teaching us to open our spirit to you when we come to you, we want to more than worship or pray. We want to open our spirit when we worship and pray. We want you to commune with us. We want you to deposit the revelation of the beauty of your Son into our spirit as we come before you and pray this divine love song back to you. Lord, I ask that you would woo our hearts to you in the fire of love. In the name of Jesus, amen. Session 13, the ultimate two-fold test of maturity, chapter 5, verse 2 to 8. It's a very dramatic uh, part of the book, chapter 5 is. It's heart-wrenching. It's, it's a very different flavor than the four chapters before. Let's read it. I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew. My locks are covered with the drops of the night, or his hair has the the dew drops of the night upon it. I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I defile them again? My beloved put his hand upon the latch of the door. My heart yearned for him. I rose to open for my beloved. My hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers dripped with liquid myrrh, is the idea, upon the handles of the lock of the door. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and he was gone. This is where the crisis begins. My heart leapt. It leapt up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called for him, but he gave me no answer. The watchmen who go about the city, they found me. They struck me. They wounded me. This is the second test is going on as the watchmen wound her. The keepers of the walls took my veil away from me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am lovesick. This is the second time in the book where she describes herself as lovesick. The first time in chapter 2, verse 5 Under the most delightful circumstances, she's lovesick in chapter 2, verse 5. However, in the most difficult circumstances, she continues to be lovesick in chapter 5, verse 8. The overview. Jesus reveals himself as the one who suffered alone in the Garden of Gethsemane. This sixth revelation of Jesus begins the second four chapters of the eight-chapter psalm. The first four chapters focus upon the bride's inheritance. The second four chapters emphasize Jesus' inheritance. It's the reality that she belongs to Him. This reality preoccupies her heart. I belong to Him is what is pulsating through her being. A few sentences down, she begins to view her life through the lens of the pleasure she brings the Lord. Her pleasure is enhanced in living for His pleasure. Her pleasure is enhanced in living for His pleasure. Her greatest pleasure is now, this is new for her, now her greatest pleasure is found in doing all of the will of God. This is the way that Jesus walked in John chapter 4. Verse 34, He said, It is my food, it is my nourishment In the language of Song of Solomon, it is my delight to do all the will of God. She is now joining Jesus in this kind of lifestyle in the Holy Spirit. She's being invited to join Jesus in the fellowship of his sufferings. Philippians 3.10, Paul says that I might know him and the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of suffering, Paul adds. He longs for intimacy, number one, to know him. He longs to move in the power of God in ministry. He wants to know the power of the resurrection. But he says, I want to know the intimacy of the fellowship of suffering alongside Jesus Christ. One of the most glorious and terrifying 
realities that God can bring His people into. And Paul walked in these apostolic sufferings, the counterattack of Satan as he plundered Satan's kingdom. The fellowship of suffering. Jesus wanted, uh, Paul wanted partnership with Jesus even in this place, the place of suffering. Philippians 3.10. She responds in instant obedience. And after her obedience, Jesus first tests her faith by withdrawing his presence from her. She obeys and the presence of the Lord is withdrawn. The manifest presence is lifted off of her heart. Then secondly, after she obeys, Jesus tests her faith by allowing the spiritual authorities in the church to wound her unjustly. And finally, she responds in love and humility. She is lovesick as a, as a maturing bride in the twofold test of maturity. Her lovesickness of chapter 2, verse 5, proves itself strong and mature in adversity in chapter 5, verse 8. And of course, that's our goal, isn't it? Not just to love Him when uh, everything is going our way in chapter 2, but to, abs- but to love Him, to be overwhelmed in love when the disappointments are crashing in all around us. Jesus calls her to the fellowship of suffering. I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks. And here's what the Lord says to her. Open for me. The Lord's knocking. He says, open your spirit, open your heart for me. And he speaks four things to her. My sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. What a sentence. Jesus comes to her as the one from the garden of Gethsemane. He says, open for me. Because my head is covered with dew, my locks or my hair with the drops of the night. Now, his hair is covered with dew, which speaks of being outside all night. He comes with hair drenched with the night dew. His locks speak of his hair. His hair covered with the drops of the night speak of the one who has stayed out all outside throughout the night season. He calls her to himself in the intimacy of the fellowship of suffering. She calls, Jesus calls her to open her heart to new, to new depths of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' cry, open for me. Open your heart for me, he's saying. I don't want you at a distance. I want all of you. Open wide your heart. I am a safe God, chapter 3. And I am a bridegroom God. I am ravished for you, chapter 4. And I want all of you, is what he's saying, I want you to share fully in everything my Father has put before me. What a a glorious but terrifying, in in a holy sense, cry when the Lord Jesus draws near and says, open wide your heart to the new places. He's not just saying open wide your heart so that your ministry will get larger, but open your heart to me, for I am the one whose head is covered with the dew of the night. The God that Jesus wants her to open to is the God of Gethsemane. Not just the God of anointed ministry. Many believers find the God of ministry more easily to open to. This is the God of Gethsemane, the one whose hair is drenched with the dew of the night, who's beckoning her to to say yes to the myrrh of God, to the mountain of myrrh, chapter 4, verse 6. Jesus' purpose in knocking, he knocks at the door. He wants us to open our heart open to him that our hearts would grow in love that's what's going on she experiences the rest of faith she says i sleep but my heart is awake is how it should read i sleep but my heart is awake and it is the voice of my beloved she says i sleep it speaks of being in the in a place of the rest of faith with confidence in the lord She is sleeping in the sense of being completely at peace because she believes that he is the safe God of Song of Solomon 3 and the ravished bridegroom of Song of Solomon 4. And so she's at peace as she has agreed in chapter 4 verse 16 to to accept the north winds if the Lord would send them. 
My heart is awake. Her heart is fully awake to spiritual things. She's in the rest of faith. I I have it, number one. I'll go back to that. Jesus knew the rest of faith as he slept in the boat in the storm. It's that kind of dynamic at peace and at rest and yet fully alive in the Lord. It's that paradox of calm, yet calm on the inside, but vigorous in love. It's one of those paradoxes in the love of God where we're serene but vigorous. We're at rest and yet we're violent in lovesickness. It's both and. I was mentioning last week the paradox of lovesickness is that we're in lovesickness, you're totally satisfied and yet you're hungry for more. It's one, of the mo- it's one of the great mysteries of the personality of God that he could be so satisfied in the fellowship of the Trinity and within himself and each of the persons of the Godhead are so satisfied within who they are as persons of the Godhead, and yet hungry for the love of the body of Christ. Fully satisfied, yet thirsty at the same time. One of the great mystery paradox of love in the personality of God. Her heart is fully awake to spiritual things. Remember in 4.6 she prayed, I will go to the mountain of myrrh. Remember myrrh is that burial spice, that sweet, fragrant, expensive, Rare burial spice. All of those dynamics are involved in myrrh. She said in verse 6, I will go. And in verse 16, she said, Send the north winds. Send the winds of difficulty. I'm not afraid. I only want the spice of God to emanate out of my life in a greater way. What courage. This isn't just some religious platitude. This is a passionate plea from her heart. I'm not afraid of the north winds. I'm not afraid of the mountain of myrrh. You're a safe God, chapter 3, and you're a ravished bridegroom God, chapter 4. You are so wild in your abandonment of love to me, I'm not afraid of you. What a revelation. Chapter 4 is essential for chapter 5 to enter into the fellowship of sufferings. And I believe as the end time church enters into a dimension of difficulty unparalleled in history, the end time church will enter into dimensions of chapter 5 but will come in an overflow, an unprecedented unveiling of chapter 4, the ravished heart of the bridegroom. Sovereign intervention, calling her to new depths. I sleep, my heart's awake, and here's the phrase, it's the voice of my beloved, it's his voice. He releases his voice, number one, he releases his knock, number two. His voice and his knock. His words and his hand tugging at her heart, knocking on the door of her heart. She is sensitive to the voice of Jesus, which would, we would receive the voice of Jesus through the inward promptings of the Holy Spirit and through filling our hearts with the written word of God, the Logos. The Holy Spirit, through the Logos, the written word of God, causes us to hear the voice of the Lord. See, we can only hear His voice or discern His will when we understand more truly who He is. It's difficult to hear, to receive the communication, I am ravished over you if our image of God is one that is not a ravished bridegroom. Through the written Word of God in the Spirit, we, get a, we establish a paradigm of God as a ravished bridegroom, then we can hear His voice calling us into intimacy at many levels. The intimacy of ministry of chapter 2 and the intimacy of suffering, chapter 5. We can can receive the message, the various dimensions of intimacy with God when we know He's a God who desires intimacy. He's a bridegroom God. But many people don't have a bridegroom God in their thinking. They have a coach and a taskmaster. He wants no intimacy. Intimacy is not upon his agenda at all. And when the Lord beckons them to intimacy, they can't hear it. They have no grid for it. So it's the promptings of the Holy Spirit, but it's also the heart filled with the Word of God. Again, I hear it all the time. How do I grow in this? I said it's not a difficult answer. It's a costly answer, but it's not a confusing answer. The answer is very, very simple. It just is costly. But people are constantly confused before this sense of a very, very difficult answer. I go, no, no, the answer's quite easy. 
Fill your understanding with the bridal paradigm of the kingdom of God. And the things that you learn, turn them into prayer. Get in the marathon pace. I like to invite people to a 10-year pace before they, a 10-year commitment before they conclude it doesn't work. Not a three-month one, a 10-year one. Get in a marathon pace. Just get, go for it. Fill your mind with it and then turn it into prayer, into dialogue, and let the Holy Spirit set your heart on fire. It's not a confusing answer. We must turn the Word of God into prayer. Or the Word of God is is an exciting uh, reality, but it never ever warms the heart with fire. The thing I know it's inevitable that some will take this class and five years from now they will remember the Song of Solomon class even with fondness. They'll say, oh, that was a good class. And I hope I never hear that testimony because my heart will be broken. I, this isn't just about a good memory of five year, from five years from now. This is about setting hearts on fire when we turn this into prayer. She can receive the voice of the beloved because her mind is filled with the word of God. First it's his voice and now it's his knock. It's his hand knocking on the door of the heart, the divine initiative. He knocks on the door of her heart in answer to her prayer for the north winds in chapter 4 verse 16. She said, send the north winds, send the difficulties that spice would emanate out of my heart. I'm not afraid of the difficulties because I know you're a bridegroom God. I'm not afraid of intimacy with you in difficult places. The knock refers to the initiative God takes to bring us forward. He knocks at the door of our heart. I have two verses here in Revelation 3. I have set before you an open door, Jesus says. 3.8. 3.20. I, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. The Lord depicts The going forward in the realm of the Spirit with heart reality as Him opening a door or knocking on the door of our heart. Jesus uses this very imagery. When He says, I open a new door, He's talking about new realities in God, in the kingdom of God by the Holy Spirit. And when He knocks on the door, it's the door of the heart, beckoning the heart to a deeper response to go through the open door of God. And the intimacy, even the intimacy of suffering, as well as the intimacy of anointing, as well as the intimacy of worship and love and abandonment. The Lord wants intimacy on a number of levels. He wants us in the prayer closet, uh, lovesick like He is, intimacy and worship. He wants us on the mountain. Serving him with lions and lepers, bringing the mandate of the Father to disciple the nations. Intimacy in ministry, and he wants intimacy with him in the fellowship of suffering, which is the counterattack of Satan. Whenever his God's servants plunder Satan's kingdom, the Lord allows a measure of counterattack because the Scripture describes this as as intruding into Satan's kingdom against Satan's will, binding him, taking his subjects, and ripping them out of his possession and liberating them. And the Lord says because Satan has certain judicial rights, because the kingdom was given to him, there is a counterattack dimension in this age. That's a, a, a whole uh, a doctrine in and of itself, the the, uh, the judicial nature of the counterattack of Satan because Adam yielded his position as the governor of this, fallen, uh, uh, of this lower world. And he gave it over to Satan by an act of his free will. And so from that time, Satan is called the God of this present evil age. It's called the God of this world. He was given that role by, Satan, by, by Adam. God gave it to Adam. Adam gave it to Satan. So when we invade Satan's turf, there is a judicial dimension where Satan justly can strike us because we go against his will. We bind him and we loose his captives and liberate them into the kingdom of God. And the apostles in the, Old, in the New Testament were those who filled up that which was lacking in the sufferings of Christ. There is this dimension of the kingdom of God that's very real. The Lord beckons. He stands at the door and he knocks. The knock of Revelation 3, 20, 21 brings us to the communion table. The verse right above it, he says, I stand at the door and knock. If you will hear my voice, the very language of, of Song of Solomon 5, 2. Here it is. Jesus is now speaking right out of Song of Solomon 5, 2. Here's what he says. He goes, if you open this door and come with me, you'll sit at the table with me. You'll dine with me. It, it, I... We will feast one with another. Of course, God's table is Song of Solomon 5.1. 
That's where Jesus feeds his friends, and that's where he feeds on the heart of the bride. That's the the Lord's table is the place of intimacy with his bride. It's the wedding table. There's only one table in the kingdom of God that, that, that the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, interacts with. It's the wedding table, and there's tokens of it in the communion table, and all the tables throughout redemptive history are pointing to the great wedding table at the end of the age, Revelation 19. Jesus is beckoning her. To come and dine with him at the table. Again, that Song of Solomon chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 are, are, are captured in, these very, in the very language of Revelation 3.20. And Jesus is the one speaking here. He feasts on our hearts. And then he allows us to feast on his heart. It's the great table of communion. The divine motivation. He knocks. Saying, open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. Because my head is covered with dew, etc. The message is open for me. Then four titles communicate his divine affirmation. He uses the the, the pronoun my four times in verse 2. He uses the pronoun mine nine times in verse 1, the verse before. So verse 1 and 2 is 9 plus 4. Thirteen times he says my in two verses. His ownership is being exerted. What he he has in her life and in her heart. His possession of her. But he's affirming her in four very specific times. In very, very strategic ways. To to prepare her for the intimacy of the fellowship of suffering. These are four very specific lines of truth. That equip the heart, the redeemed heart. To bear up under the sufferings of Christ calls her my sister that's his identification with her humanity because as when uh, when he says my sister he is saying i am the sympathetic high priest that we looked at last week i understand all that you're going through in your human nature that's my sister i understand i'm sympathetic and i help you as a weak human it's a very very important reality as we enter into the sufferings of christ he calls her my love which brings us to the bridal revelation of extravagant love. I am lovesick for you. I love you. I'm only wanting you to open up and come with me because of love. I want to share things with you I would never share with the cherubim and the seraphim. I want you to experience things with me on the, I mean, uh, experience things in fellowship with me while you're on the earth as a human being that you'll never experience again. Things that I experienced on the earth as a human being. You're my love. And I want in our history together all of our experiences to be shared. It's because I love you. I will not give this beckon, beckon call to any other part of my creation. You're the one I love. It's about love that I want you to stand here with me. He's saying, I'm not speaking as a coach or a taskmaster. It's not that I just want more productivity out of you. I want you to share the intimacy of time on the earth and a life by faith and the sufferings of Christ because I as a man walked in that. My love, no other part of creation will experience this. It's a whole line of truth under the title, my love. My dove. He sees her innocence. He sees her loyalty. He sees her her passion and her single-mindedness for him. And she needs to know that that's how he views her at this time to equip her for the sufferings. Lest in the time of suffering, hopelessness overcomes us in a feeling of condemnation and rejection and we buckle under the pressures of the difficulties of the cross. My perfect one. He uses this again in chapter 6 verse 9 when he calls her my perfect one. This is a, a, a statement that speaks of her intentions to perfectly obey God. There is no compromise in her. And the reason that's important to note this, because some commentaries, in verse 3, what we're going to look at in a moment, they uh, portray the bride as compromising, but she is the perfect one. She's perfect in several ways, in her obedience. She's, she's undefiled. She's perfect or undefiled. She's perfect in the sense of being mature. The word perfect and mature is often interchangeable in the New Testament. She's a mature one right now. He calls her mature again in chapter 6, verse 9. She's not a young bride with with a sincere heart only, but she's a mature one, a perfected one. 
Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 48, Be ye perfect as my heavenly Father is. Enter into spiritual maturity. I love you as in your infancy, infancy, but I want you in mature partnership. He longs for maturity because he can feast on us 13 times in two verses. My, my bride, my sister, it's, he's feasting on the bride. He wants mature, intimate fellowship with his bride. Not only is she just mature in the sense of, uh, I mean, perfect in the sense of spiritual maturity, she's the perfect choice of the Father for, to be His eternal commandion. She is the perfect choice. She is the only choice, chapter 6, verse 9 says, we'll look at next week. The only choice, the perfect choice. She feels special. She feels she's the one God wants. She feels His love. She f- senses that the Lord understands her dove-like sincerity and purity. Jesus communicates that he will be there to aid her, and he's sympathetic with her because he himself went to Gethsemane and shed drops of blood in anguish. And even under the pressure, he said, Father, is there any other way? He says, I know what it means to come under the pressure of is there another way? And yet he fed on the will of God. These four descriptions are, are very significant in equipping us for the twofold test of verse 6 and, and verse 7. She responds in full obedience. I've taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I've washed my feet. How can I defile them? My beloved put his hand upon the latch of the door. Talk about the door of her heart. My heart yearned for him. I rose. For my beloved, my hands drip with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. She's speaking about the lock of the heart. Her instant obedience, her desire to walk clean before God is what is going on here. Her desire to walk clean before God. I've taken off my robe, how can I put it on again? After this twofold test is over, Jesus' first words to her, which we'll look at in the next session and then again next week uh, uh, another time, after this t- twofold test is over, Jesus' first words to her make it abundantly clear she is being obedient instead of disobedient, as some commentators believe. Some believers saying, it's too inconvenient to take my robe off, I'm sorry, when what she's saying is, I've taken my robe off, I've put your robe on, my feet are cleaned, I will never dirty them again. She's saying exactly opposite. And Jesus' first statements, the first time he speaks to her after his presence withdraws, he calls her, he says, Oh, my love, you are beautiful, you are lovely, you are awesome as an army, a victorious army with banners. Your gaze has overwhelmed me. She has stood true in obedience here in chapter 5. Her robes speak of her deeds or her acts. I've taken my robes off. B, we're covered with his robe whereas our garments are as filthy rags. She's saying, my garments are off. Your garments are on. I've taken, I've, I've done it my way. I'm going to do it your way from now on, is what she's saying. I don't want to do it in my own way like I did in my early days. How can I put it on again? She's asking, how can I go back to the sin and compromise of wearing my own garments, doing my own thing? She acknowledged that Jesus has cleansed her. She says, my feet have been washed. I have washed my feet in the word of God, in redemption. Our feet get dirty through our contact with the fallen world and our endeavors to serve the Lord. But her feet are clean. She's living in an undefiled life right now. Jesus told Peter that he was clean, but he still needed his feet cleansed. He was speaking to Peter and the apostles in John 13. He was speaking spiritually to them. He said, all of you are clean except for one, speaking of uh, of, uh, Judas, and he's a devil. He said, all of you are clean. He's talking spiritually in John 13. Incidentally, that's a very powerful passage because in that very same discussion, he said, and every one of you will deny me this night. How could they be clean and deny him this night? Because the Lord views us and defines us by the yes in our spirit and by the gift of righteousness. The very apostles, he says, you are clean. And then later he says, I love you like the Father loves me. And then later he says, but each one of you will deny me. But you will recover. You will recover. 
That's amazing that they could be clean and yet would deny him that very night. And Jesus had it by foreknowledge. But he said, your feet are dirty. And Peter said, no. And the Lord says, well, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have anything to do with me. Because Jesus is speaking figuratively of Peter's defilement in the world. When we serve the Lord, when we get into the battle, we get a wrong spirit. We get bruised and injured. And there's compromise that touches us and dirt and filth. And the Lord says, you're clean, but I do want to wash your feet regularly. Your lives are clean in redemption. But in the in the midst of the intensity of the battle, we get those wrong spirit, and we say bad things, and we do bad things, and we react wrong, and the Lord cleanses us on a daily basis. That's what he was telling Peter. Peter didn't understand it. He thought Jesus was modeling servanthood, but he was also speaking spiritually about their need to be cleansed, and because they were going to actually fall even that very night. She refuses to defile her feet through compromise. She goes, how can I defile them? I'm clean. I will never defile myself again. I'm not going that route again is what she's saying. God's grace is released upon her heart, is released upon her heart. My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door. I love that. By the latch of the door. And and that's in verse 4 and verse 5. It says, by the handles of the lock. It's speaking of the heart both times. The door of the heart Remember Revelation 3, we just looked at, Jesus talks about the door. He's talking about the door of the heart. And this is the Son of God in person speaking this verse in a figurative, allegorical way. It gives us good ground to understand what he's talking about here in the the song. The latch of the door speaks of the door of her heart. Her beloved, or the one that she loves, is resting his hand upon her. His hand refers to the grace of God. I have a a passage in Acts 11 where the hand of the Lord was being manifest and the grace of God was abundant. The apostles described the hand of the Lord as that which releases the grace of God upon people. So here's what's going on. She says, the Lord put his hand upon my heart to unlock the deep places of my heart. It takes the power of God to enter into the sufferings of Christ. And to maintain our lovesickness and our purity of devotion. The hand of grace causes her to yearn with desire and love. She goes, oh, my heart yearns for you. She's not compromising. Beloved, she is filled with desire. Verse five, uh, verse 8 says, I'm lovesick for him. She's yearning here in, 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 here in verse 4. And her heart leaps in verse 5. And she's lovesick in verse 8. She's not compromising at all takes God's help for us to love God. God puts his hand on the lock of our hearts, and we have the power to respond. She instantly responds, I arose, I opened for him. I opened my spirit deep to him as the God of Gethsemane. Not just the God of the anointed ministry, to the God of Gethsemane I opened my spirit to that God. Not just to the one to anoint me out in the mountains in ministry, but I said yes to intimacy and whatever he would beckon me to to cause spice to go forth in my garden. Again, you can never ever press into this kind of perseverance, this mature steadfastness in chapter 5 without the revelation of the ravished bridegroom God of chapter 4, which comes after the safe God of chapter 3, which comes after the beautiful God of chapter 1 and 2. The progression is clear. She goes, I arose. She instantly obeys. I arose depicts her full obedience. She doesn't stay on the bed. Her response is exactly the opposite of chapter 3, verse 1. She's not on the bed. She arose instantly to say yes to him. She goes, I'm not afraid of Gethsemane is what she's saying. I'm not afraid of the dew drops in the night alone. Because you will be with me as my brother, as my fellow human with sympathetic aid. You have full understanding of who I am. She makes it clear, not only does she, uh, does she arise to open, she opens for him. It's a love affair that's going on. It's not an heroic kind of militaristic, if I lose my life, I lose it for the cause. No, she's doing it for him. She's doing, she's opening for him. 
She wants intimacy with the God who already went through Gethsemane. She wants intimacy with the God of Gethsemane. It's intimacy that she's after, not some kind of religious Islamic heroism. I'll lose my life and maybe I'll get rewarded in eternity for it. No, it's after a quest of the intimacy of the fellowship of sufferings. I arose and opened for Him, not just the cause in a religious way, for Him. I opened to it for the God that already went through Gethsemane. The safe God of Gethsemane is a bridegroom God. He's a lovesick God. He's a beautiful God. He's a ravish God. The God of Gethsemane is a sympathetic God. That's what's going on. I tell you what, beloved, again, the, the end time church, as God begins to beckon us to arise and to voluntarily enter into the realities of chapter 5, we will not do it without the bridal paradigm of chapter 4, of actually chapter 1 through 4. Because chapter 5 is a voluntary response. Yes, there are persecutions that we don't voluntarily say yes to, but many persecutions along the way, there's the power to close our heart and back away in fear. Many of the accounts of persecution throughout church history, there was the line of demarcation where one part of the body said, I will arise and open for him and we will stand. And the governments or the powers that be caused great trouble. And weeks, months, and years later, the great crisis of, 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 of a persecution comes. Whereas the other believers decided not to voluntarily come, they came up with a way that seemed like the wisdom of God to draw back in fear. And so when the one group are persecuted, they sit on the sidelines watching and kind of troubled and a little bit of uncertain. But there was a time where they would not arise to the God of Gethsemane for Him. It's about intimacy. It's not about heroics. It's about intimacy. That's the safe and the sure paradigm for the end time church that goes through martyrdom. It's about intimacy. God's grace empowers her heart to embrace sacrifice. My hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the lock. Myrrh again speaks of of death. Death to, to our flesh. Death to the natural, even the legitimate natural comforts. That God, as a rule, releases to His people. It's death even to legitimate privileges in the natural. Speaks of death to self. She said yes to the mountain of Myrn 4.6. She said yes to the north winds in 4.16. Now she's saying yes to the Jesus of Gethsemane. Here it is. The progression is developed. She's right there. I want to be able to say with greater clarity, Lord, I want the lock of my heart... The lock of my heart dripped in the myrrh of the grace of God. We begin praying now. Lord, we are willing to be made willing. That's where the prayer is. Lord, I want the myrrh of God. I want your hand on my heart releasing myrrh. Where did the myrrh get? How did the myrrh get on her heart? It came from his hand upon her heart. The God of Gethsemane puts his hand upon her heart and her heart has myrrh. She has the anointing to say yes to difficulty. Myrrh on the heart is the anointing of the grace of God, the fragrance and the power to say yes to difficulty. That's myrrh on the heart. Oh, let my heart yearn for you. Unlock the door. I want a place of intimacy that the angels and the seraphim and cherubim will never, ever have an opportunity to enter. And even the saints in the age to come cannot enter into the sufferings of this age. We can only do it now. Once we step over the line, that will never, ever, will that opportunity of intimacy ever open again. The human God of of Gethsemane beckons his beloved, his bride that he's ravished over to join him for one brief time in her billions of years to enter into a dimension of intimacy that no other part of creation can ever experience. It says, I'll put myrrh, I'll put that fragrant spice on your, that, that spice upon your heart. I will empower you. I will put it upon you if you want it. So even in these early days, we say, yes, 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 Lord. Make us willing to be willing. We're not afraid because you're a safe God, chapter 3. You're a bridegroom God, chapter 4. You're a beautiful God, chapter uh, 1. And you're a God that gives unparalleled pleasures to the human spirit. That's in chapter 2. My hands dripped with myrrh. Her hands spoke of her works of ministry. Everything she's touching, she's willing to allow the myrrh of God to to impact it, influence it. 
Her hands throughout uh, the book speak of ministry. It's the active working. She goes, I will say yes. My, the, my hands and my heart together will be impacted by the mirror of God. This anointing to say yes to the intimacy of suffering. Five, my fingers are drip with liquid myrrh. Speak of the activity of working faith that embraces the cross in love. We develop the idea a little bit more. You can read it on your own. Here we are as the first test of suffering. The great, the ultimate twofold test. Here it is, the first one. She said, I opened, I obeyed, but it was a very shocking result. My beloved turned. He was gone. My heart leapt when he spoke. She said, I responded eagerly when you said come. My heart was filled with the word of God. I could hear you say come to the place of Gethsemane, and I actually came. See, most believers can't hear the Lord say come to Gethsemane. That's got to be religion. Their whole grid, if it anything is uncomfortable, it's religion and legalism. She could hear the voice beckoning her to Gethsemane, and it was a voice with the fragrance of God on it. She goes, not only could I hear it, I actually did it instantaneously. I leapt up. But she goes, you're not here. The first of the ultimate twofold test. God will train every mature believer with this test. It's part of the divine pattern. It is the progression that all of us will go through to mature holy passion. Of course, the application is different in everyone's life. Only two times in the book has the Lord hidden his face, chapter 3 and chapter 5. Chapter 5, he hid his face because of her obedience. Chapter 3, because of disobedience. It's a very, very different dynamic going on here. Again, it's, it's something that we can only have confidence to respond to because of the revelation of the ravished bridegroom of chapter 4. That's why the bridal paradigm is massively important before the experience of the fellowship of suffering becomes a, a wholesale experience for the church in the Western world. It already is a more and more common experience for the church in the third world. But to the Western church, we're not used to that. But God is going to equip us. I don't think He's going to uh, uh, shock us. He's going to equip us, and we're going to long for intimacy in any arena of life, whether it's in suffering, in ministry, or in worship. We want the heart of God and our hearts to be unified. We're not going to draw back. We'll rise up. We'll leap with joy. We will yearn and respond instantly. It won't be account the cost. It will be, I want to be with you wherever you are. He says, I want to feed on your heart in Gethsemane. Will you go to Gethsemane and let me feed upon your heart? Chapter 5, verse 1. She says, yes. She testifies that she obeys him. I open for him. It's the second time she emphatically says, I've opened. First, it's chapter 5, verse 5, then chapter 5, verse 6. My heart leapt. He suddenly withdraws his presence. What a surprise. What a surprise. My beloved, the greatest desire of her life in the early stages of love was to feel the presence of God. It's a very surprising experience. I don't believe she anticipated this. In chapter 2, the only thing she wanted, remember, sustain me, refresh me, lovesick, apples, grapes, vineyard worship music, you know, the whole bit. It's all she wanted, and now he hides his face from her. My beloved had turned away and was gone. It's a sovereign act of God withdrawing his presence to test her. His manifest presence is held. However, he never leaves us. It's the discernible feelings on the heart. He never leaves us in reality. But the, pres- the ability to discern his, the feelings upon our heart is what is lifted. The Catholics in the Middle Ages spoke of a concept with St. John of the Cross was the first one to use the phrase and to popularize it. It was called the dark night of the soul. It's the time when we obey the Lord and yet we cannot discern the activity of the Spirit while in the place of obedience. And in that place, God drawing us into a deeper abandonment and a deeper maturity than we ever could have received without this dimension of the north winds. See, there's a part of the spice that will never be loosed apart from the north winds, and these are the north winds blowing. Incidentally, just as a, as, as a note, I don't have this on the notes, there are seven crises in the book. Seven crises that she goes through. 
The first crisis is in chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. It's the crisis of scandalous sin, of sin in her life. The second crisis she runs into is chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. It's the crisis of fear in her immaturity. It's not scandalous sin. It's not grievous sin. It's fear. She's afraid to go to the high places with the Lord in chapter 2. And she draws back and says no. The next crisis is when she's on her bed in chapter 3 and the Lord's gone and she's really thrown into a tailspin and she has to work her way through that. Does she run to him or from him? And she has to settle out. She has to, to be established in the first time he lifts his presence after she's been walking and communing with the Lord. The fourth crisis of the book is in chapter 4, verse 6 and 16. In verse 6, I will go to the mountain of myrrh. Verse 16, send the north winds. Beloved, That may not seem like a crisis until you've done it in the spirit of truth. You've opened your spirit and said, Lord, I really will go even in the one area that I won't normally go on. When we say yes, our spirit begins to go, yes, okay, okay. I mean, I mean, yes, I will go. Yeah, this is for sure. That's a crisis. It's a It's okay to preach it, it's okay to write it in in Christian encouragement cards, but to do it in reality is a crisis. The next crisis is chapter 5, verse 6, the the fifth one, when the presence of the Lord leaves her the second time because of obedience. The next crisis is chapter 5, verse 7, when she's wounded by the body of Christ. And the next one is chapter 6, verse 13, when there's division in the church related to her. Those are the seven crises she goes through, and we'll... uh, we might, we, we might look at them more in the, in the uh, coming sessions. The Protestants don't have a theology for living in fervency and obedience with God hiding His presence. Protestants are more like Job's friends. When God hides His face from devout, you must be sinning. The Catholics, especially of the medieval ages of those those centuries, they said when you're pressing in sometimes, the Lord hides His face to cause you to come in with with a greater desperation, with a greater fervency, and it produces greater humility, it produces greater intimacy, it produces greater lovesickness at the end. But the Protestants were more like Job's friends were saying, If if you're not feeling the presence of the Lord, you must be sinning. It's a massively strong Protestant paradigm. But I want to tell you, I believe by the spirit of truth, the Lord does hide His presence, even in times of obedience, to woo us to places of intimacy and depth we could never know otherwise. It's called the north winds that create spice in your heart. There is the the disciplining with hiding of the presence of chapter 3, but there's the The increase of spice, hiding of your presence of chapter 5. God sometimes hides his face from the righteous to draw out that yearning. He wants an equally yoked bride that says, not my will, but your will. When I don't feel like it, I'm still yours 100%. That's what the hiding of his presence produces in our hearts. I believe that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane felt... Very, very difficult emotions and said yes. She fervently seeks the Lord without a spiritual breakthrough. She accelerates her time of seeking. I sought him. I called out for him. She's, she's doubling her, her urgency. More prayer, more fasting, but she can't break through because it's not related to sin or the devil. It's related to God drawing her into a place of obedience regardless of the measure of disappointment. See, the Lord's going to be dealing with, is dealing with the two number one issues of disappointment in her life. I'll develop that in just a moment after we look at the second test, persecution and rejection. The watchman who went around the city, found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took my veil. The watchmen and the keepers of the walls are the same ones. They speak of the spiritual authorities in the church. They go around the city. These, I I have it written in here, there's the David-type watchmen who help her find intimacy with the Lord in chapter 3. And there's the Saul-type watchmen who are looking for some way to discredit her and to destroy her ministry. 
How many of you know there's two types of watchmen in the body of Christ? Two types of people with spiritual authority in the church. The ecclesiastical authority. I'm not saying they have a, well, no, sometimes they have the true anointing of the Lord. Do you know the Lord has use of the Saul watchman? We always, I, I talk to people, they, let's have all the dissenters or all the folks causing trouble. Lord, move them. We have need of the people that cause us trouble. Someone says, so-and-so, you know, on the radio who's troubling everybody. Lord, take their voice away. If the Lord takes their voice away, he'll send ten more because we need that voice to drive us into maturity. That voice produces, that negative voice produces tremendous responses at the depth of our being. Our problem is not the Saul-type watchman. That's not our problem. Our problem, in a holy sense, is that a ravished God wants intimacy with us in the place of everything he experienced as a human being under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In the sense he wants us in ministry, he wants us in the place of abandonment and love we call worship, and he wants us in the place of suffering alongside himself. He's a bridegroom. Our problem isn't the guys on the radio. Our problem in a holy way is a bridegroom wants us to enter into the deepest realms of love possible and the spice does not come forth without the north winds. We need these ministries. The Lord will sort it all out in his own day. But we need them now. We are too weak and too carnal to mature without these, without their help. I'm serious. The weakness and the carnality of our spiritual lives demand this kind of help. The watchmen, they struck me. They wounded me. Oh, you can read that. Wounded, struck. Just say, out. I mean, you can feel that, can't you? Struck and wounded. It's not just they attacked. They struck. They touched the nerve. They hurt her. She went alone away and went, Oh, God, that hurt me, what they did to me. It hurt, it wounded her. Wounded in the house of my friends is what happened to Jesus and all of his holy servants through history. They're wounded in the house of friends. It's a part of the progression. So many things deep in our spirit get uncovered in these, in this crisis. Her spiritual coverings taken. They took her veil away. They took her place of function away from her. Her covering. Her veil, her covering is lifted. They wound her. They discredit her. They tell evil reports. And then they won't let her function. Her spiritual covering is lifted. Summary. I'll summarize this. Remember at the beginning of of the book, she had a twofold uh, life vision, right? Draw me and let me run. She said, I want to feel God in intimacy. Draw me. And I want to run in ministry. The two things she cried out for in chapter 1, verse 4. Draw me. His presence is now lifted. Let me run. Well, the leaders of the body kicked her out. She can't, she can't, she doesn't feel being drawn in the presence of the Lord, nor does she feel the anointing to run. She has, just put the word, disappointment. Whether spiritual, the Lord's presence is lifting, or natural circumstances, whether in ministry or in the other parts of life, circumstances, difficult circumstances that disappoint and cause pain. God uses this to open up the garden spices of our life. Here she's standing here just in the raw, naked faith. I only wanted to be drawn and run. I can do neither right now. And the Lord looks at her and says, Are you really my garden, like you said in 416? Or are you going to revert back and be your own garden? Are you taking charge or are you mine still? He's watching her. I charge you. She goes to the daughters. If you find my beloved, tell him. I'm lovesick under the most terrible, disappointing circumstances, spiritual and natural circumstances. Tell him I'm not offended. I'm lovesick. I'm not just lovesick at the table under the shade with the grapes. I'm lovesick in adversity because in chapter 5, the lovesickness of chapter 5 is far more mature and deeper than the lovesick of chapter 2. Lovesickness of chapter 2 is when everything's going fine and the Lord sets it up that way. But he's wooing her into intimacy with himself. She asked, actually asked the daughters, the more immature ones, go help me find him. I mean, what? The leaders have kicked her out. She goes to the young ones and says, help me find Jesus. And they're going, help you find what? I mean, you're like the main one. She goes, I'll find Jesus in any way that he'll minister to me. But if you find him, tell him I don't feel anything and I have no ministry. It's all gone. But tell him, 
I'm sick with love. I meant what I said in chapter 4, verse 16. I am now your garden forever. Oh, God, let your spice flow in my life. That's what's going on here. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we ask you. Lord, send the north winds so that your spice will flow out of our spirit so that our garden is truly your garden. That We are preoccupied with you and not what we're feeling and sensing. Lord, you're not just a means to an end. You are the end. Oh, great bridegroom king. Oh, lovesick God, make us lovesick. We're willing to be willing. Put your hand of myrrh upon our hearts and let myrrh drip on our hearts. Oh, Lord, we love you. We thank you. Amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.